In today's lecture, we're going to discuss three genera of bacteria which are primarily found in water, Aeromonas, Plesiomonas, and Vibrio. These bacteria cause some really important diseases in fish and other aquatic species, as well as potentially some zoonotic infections in people. Organisms within all three genera are considered biocontainment level 2, and they're all gram-negative rods. Aeromonas and Plesiomonas are straight gram-negative rods, while Vibrio have a characteristic curved or comma-like morphology, like you can see in this illustration here. Like I said, these organisms are associated with water. We find them in both aquatic and marine environments, and they tend to also be associated with ectothermic animals. So they're in fish, shellfish, etc. In endothermic animals, so mammals like us, um, they cause enteric disease. One organism within this group, Vibrio cholera, produces a, a really important toxin, cholera toxin, that not only causes a very severe disease, but in the laboratory setting, it's a really important tool for studying cellular physiology. In this image here, you can see Vibrio cholera growing on TCBS agar, or thiosulfate citrate bile salt sucrose agar, um, which is selective and differential. And here we have Aeromonas hydrophila growing on Columbia horse blood agar. So our typical blood agar has sheep's blood cells. Uh, this particular plate uh, contains horse blood, although Aeromonas hydrophila will also grow on sheep's blood. Here you can see a pure culture, a gram stain, of Vibrio parahemolyticus. And particularly on the right, I think you can appreciate that many of these cells have a slightly curved morphology. They're a little bit comma-shaped, and that's a really characteristic uh, morphological finding uh, with organisms from this genus. Here we have the much straighter appearing uh, Aeromonas species. If we consider the natural hosts or habitats of our Aeromonas, Plesiomonas, and Vibrio, uh, Aeromonas we tend to find in both aquatic and marine environments. Uh, it's part of the normal microbiome of fish, and it's common in uh, the water itself. Plesiomonas shigalloides is an aquatic organism, so it's not halophilic, and it's not one that we tend to find in salt water although we may find it in brackish water, so water which has a, a lower uh, salt concentration than seawater. Vibrio is found in both aquatic and marine environments, and we associate it primarily with shellfish. Um, it can be in the intestinal tract of mammals, including people, um, where it can be a colonizer and also cause a very severe disease. These three genera that we're talking about today are really only related to each other at a very high level. So they're in the same bacterial class. They're all gamma proteobacteria. The genus Plesiomonas only includes one species, Plesiomonas shigalloides, and it's actually found within our Enterobacteriaceae family along with E. coli. Aeromonas has 32 species, and there are 149 different vibrios. These can be differentiated each other morphologically based on whether they're curved rods or straight rods, with curved being our vibrios. We can further subdivide our vibrios based on their ability to grow without sodium chloride. And then plesiomonas and aeromonas can be differentiated from each other through a number of simple biochemical tests, including the production of DNAs, acetoin or the VP test, and the ability to ferment mannitol. Aeromonas hydrophila produces a number of important virulence factors, including type 3 secretion systems, so these needle and syringe-like apparatus for injecting effector molecules, hemolysins, and also enterotoxins. Vibrio cholera, um, you can see over here in this gram-stained image, um, has a flagella, so it's a motile organism. It also produces cholera toxin. Um, this is a canonical toxin. It's one that's been really, really well studied. And the way the cholera toxin works is once it's made its way inside the enterocytes, so those intestinal epithelial cells, it binds to G proteins. And G proteins play an important role in the regulation of um, cell signaling and cell physiology. So those activated G proteins turn on adenylate cyclase. We get increased cyclic AMP, which then interferes with sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate metabolism within the cells. 
What we ultimately get is an increased excretion of ions into the lumen of the gut. And with ion excretion, water is going to flow. So it's going to move with those ions. We get water moving into the lumen, and then we see diarrhea. So the pathogenesis of these infections, that very profound watery diarrhea that we see, can be linked back to a very simple um, uh, toxin and its sort of cascade of effects uh, within the host. Aeromonas hydrophila, we associate with red leg disease in frogs and one of many organisms that can cause necrotic stomatitis in snakes. In people, it can be a cause of food poisoning. Aeromonas salmonicida is a very important cause of furunculosis in fish, particularly our farmed fish species. Vibrio cholera causes cholera in people. Um, other species of Vibrio can also be pathogenic for people, including Vibrio vulnificus, which can cause uh, septicemia following ingestion. We can see necrotizing skin lesions and muscle infections, so it can be quite nasty. Vibrio harvii is a species which has a very broad host range among uh, marine organisms. So it infects fish and a variety of invertebrates and causes many different clinical presentations, which we'll briefly talk about at the end of the lecture. And then finally, Plesiomonas shigalloides causes opportunistic infections in fish. I think it's increasingly recognized. And in people, it causes gastroenteritis. We're going to start off by talking about Aeromonas hydrophila and red leg disease or bacterial septicemia. Um, we see this in frogs, and it can involve a number of organisms, a number of gram negatives, um, including quite commonly Aeromonas hydrophila. We most commonly see this in amphibians, which are malnourished or in poor quality water. And the clinical manifestations of septicemia and red leg disease specifically are ulcerations, petechiation on the legs and abdomen, so they have red legs. Um, they're also going to be lethargic and perhaps emaciated. This organism also causes necrotic stomatitis in snakes. So one of many bacteria, some of which we've talked about in earlier lectures, in this image here, you can see an African clawed frog, so one of our Xenopus species with red leg disease. And I think you can appreciate these hemorrhagic lesions on the mouth, almost looks like he's wearing lipstick, um, toes and legs. So uh, septicemic disease in our amphibians and also in our fish commonly manifests as petechiation and ecchymotic hemorrhaging that's visible on uh, the skin surface. Aeromonas salmonicida um, causes disease in a wide variety of fish, perhaps most importantly from an aquaculture perspective are the salmonids. It's associated with disease, particularly in high density aquaculture settings, but also in aquarium fish. And what we tend to see are ulcerative lesions, hemorrhages, and furunculosis. So this would be an example of a furuncle, so sort of a large uh, cutaneous abscess. On this fish here, you can see some hemorrhagic lesions uh, near the tail. On necropsy, um, internal lesions can be seen as well. So this fish on the left has multifocal hepatic abscesses. I think you can appreciate these white spots or white nodules in the liver. And then on the right, we have a fish with uh, peritonitis. So we have this blood-tinged blood um, abdominal fluid. Both of these animals were septicemic with Aeromonas salmonicida. Interestingly, there's been some research uh, recently looking at the role of pollution and specifically microplastics as kind of a mechanical vector for Aeromonas salmonicida. So all of these um, sort of slow to degrade materials that are being put into the marine ecosystems can almost serve as like little rafts that Aeromonas salmonicida can grab onto and allow it to be transported to distant regions which may not have had uh, previous problems with Aeromonas salmonicida. So kind of an interesting example of some uh, perhaps unanticipated downstream effects of environmental pollution. Plesiomonas shigalloides uh, causes a food-related gastroenteritis in people. Um, we see it with unwashed foods or undercooked shellfish. Oftentimes it presents as just a mild watery diarrhea, but in immunosuppressed individuals, it can be a very, very severe cholera-like illness. Um, we associate it with primarily tropical and subtropical regions of the world in the summer months. This is sort of where the saying about 
not eating oysters during months which don't have an R in them comes from. So we don't want to eat raw oysters in the summer, at least in the northern hemisphere, May, June, July, and August. They're more likely to have uh, Plasiomonas shigalloides in them. This organism also causes opportunistic infections in fish. And I just wanted to highlight two recent papers that I identified um, where Plesiomonas shigalloides was found in rainbow trout or Oncorhynchus mycus, um, and also largemouth bass. So perhaps an emerging pathogen to be aware of. Next, we're going to talk about Vibrio cholera. Um, this is an organism which is not endemic in Canada, fortunately. It causes a severe acute gastroenteritis. Um, and the disease is acquired or the organism is acquired through ingestion, typically contaminated water or potentially food, which is maybe most common in developed countries. And this can be things like undercooked crab or raw oysters. Um, in fact, in the United States, um, perhaps improperly prepared or cross-contamination in the kitchen um, associated with blue, cap, blue crab has been associated with outbreaks. In people who have cholera, what we see is profuse diarrhea, um, and it can begin within just hours of ingesting the organism. It's actually described as rice water diarrhea because there can be such an incredible volume that all of the solids within the gastrointestinal tract are essentially washed out. And the diarrhea really consists of essentially clear liquid with flecks of mucus in it. You can see incredible volumes of diarrhea up to one liter per hour, and people who die of this disease often die as a result of dehydration. So that's the primary thing that we're concerned with. For anyone who's traveling to perhaps endemic regions, um, food safety is really important. So make sure that things are boiled, cooked, peeled, or ideally uh, from a food safety perspective, don't eat them at all. <laughs>